الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وإمام المتقين وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمة وقل رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من صلى علي صلاة واحدة صلى الله عليه عشرة وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من كذب علي متعمدا فليتبوأ مقعده من النار أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قوني سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب زدنا علما بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين Today is the second lesson of Al-Adab Al-Mufrid Only through the sheer mercy of Allah I know the month has passed and Allah has allowed you so that we met again Only through the sheer mercy of Allah I pray that Allah Ta'ala continues to give us the tawfiq to take part in gatherings wherein Allah and His beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are being mentioned. Last month we started Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, which is, which is the work of Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi Alayhi, the master of hadith. Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he wasn't just a normal individual. The reason why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala accepted him for hadith are numerous, but amongst the incidences from his life, Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullahu ta'ala, who is the great commentator of Sahih Bukhari. He is that uh, being who spent much of his efforts in compiling a great commentary that we hear that after the commentary of Imam Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullahu ta'ala, Fathul Bari, there is no other need for another commentary of Sahih Bukhari. He has done justice to the commentary of Sahih Bukhari. Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, whilst introducing Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions a few different incidences from his life. Inshallah, as the lessons continue throughout this year, I will try to mention to you one incident every month, inshallah, every lesson, so that we can realize who this Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi actually was. Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullahu ta'ala narrates, and he explains that Abu Ahmad ibn Uday rahimahullahu ta'ala he mentions that this Imam Bukhari, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, he traveled once to Baghdad, which is in today's Iraq, the capital of Iraq, Baghdad. When he traveled to Baghdad, new, uh, rumors went around that this great hadith master, this great muf- uh, muhaddith, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari has come to Baghdad. People had heard of his name. So from the masters of hadith in Baghdad, one of the leaders and the governor, he decided that I want to test this Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi. How powerful of a knowledge and of a mountain is he in the field of hadith? We want to find out. And our deen is very, very pure. This deen, Imam Muslim, rahmatullahi alayhi, says, Al-Isnadu as-Sanadu deenun. That this way of learning and teaching to go from the student, from the teacher, back to Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa shows how protected our deen is. So they wanted to test this Imam Bukhari, is he a true master of hadith or not? So 
So this governor, he gathered together 10 masters of hadith in Baghdad. And they were appointed to have with them gathered 10 hadith each. So if you have 10 masters of hadith and they all gather 10 hadith each, how many hadith in total? What's 10 times 10? 100. So 100 hadith in total were prepared. But they weren't prepared correctly. This governor said that you 10 a'imma leaders of hadith, we want you to muddle up the sanad. We want you to muddle up the words of the hadith. So rather than saying, for example, I heard from, for example, my teacher Abu Abdullah, say a different name. Mix and match the names, mix and match the narrations, mix and match the chain, mix and match the words of the, of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jumbly up. Let's see what this Imam Bukhari can do. So all ten masters of hadith came and met Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. And they said, the oh, Imam Bukhari, we want to narrate to you. All ten of us, we want to narrate hadith to you. Ten hadith each. Please let us know what do you think of these hadith. So then the first scholar, the first hadith master started. And he started from himself back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and narrated a hadith. But he jumbled it up. So hadith number one, hadith number two, hadith number three. And every time he says a hadith, they wait for the response of Imam Bukhari. What does Imam Bukhari say? Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi says, I have not heard this hadith. I have not heard this. For every hadith Imam Bukhari, though the words may be correct. For example, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ they are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But the transmission from this master of hadith back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there's been some sort of mix-up. So even if the words, the matan of the hadith, the actual wording of the hadith is correct, because the chain is all muddled up, this Imam Bukhari said that, I have not heard this hadith. So this happened from hadith number one, from master number one of hadith, all the way to master number ten, and the hundredth hadith. Imam Bukhari said, I have not heard this hadith. I have not heard this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I do not know of this hadith. I do not know. So now, okay, you don't know. That in itself is a great achievement. That you don't recognize these chains of hadith. This narration, you don't understand it. You don't recognize it. So then they asked him that, okay, can you correct for us? So now look at the greatness of Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. It should have been the case Imam Bukhari goes from master number 10, the scholar number 10, and from hadith number 100. Imam Bukhari says, no, you, scholar number one, you narrated hadith number one. He says the mistake, you said that such and such a person narrated, such and such a person said this, and this went back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is what you said. However, the narration that I have heard of is, and then he corrects the narration, corrects the hadith, and replies back to hadith number one. Hadith number two, hadith number three, hadith number four. In the correct chronological order, all the way to hadith number 75, hadith number 80, hadith number 99, and then hadith number 100. And it says, you narrated this hadith in such a such a way, but I have not heard this hadith. I have heard this hadith in this correct way, in this form, in this narration. And he narrated from 1 to 100, every single one of them 100 a hadith. This is the Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, whose book we are studying. So last week, we start, uh, last month, sorry, we started the work of Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi. We left on from hadith number 5. So Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi will say to us, وَبِالْإِسْنَادِ الْمُتَّسِلْ مِنَّا إِلَىٰ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ يَا بِعَبْدِ اللَّهِ Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari rahimahullahu ta'ala qal haddathana Sulaiman ibn Harb qal haddathana Wuhayb bin Khalid an ibn Shubruma qal sami'tu aba dhur'ata an abi hurirata radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal Because now we have introduced ourselves to hadith, this name, this companion Abu Huraira is going to come so many times inshallah, so many times over. Abu Huraira. Who is Abu Huraira? Now listen to realize how much zeal this Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu had. Abu Huraira we find he accepted Islam approximately in the seventh year of Hijri. So he only found approximately three years with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In them three years, he dedicated his life to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To such an extent, he spent his days, his nights, acquiring the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He was so accepted for hadith. We find in Sahih Bukhari, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, in his Sahih, mentions the incident of the people of Iraq. They came to Abu Huraira and said, Abu Huraira, whenever you speak, all you say is, Sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul. Sami'tu Khalili. I always hear 
He, you always say that, oh, I heard from Rasulullah. I heard from my beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I heard from my friend, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever you speak, you always quote hadith. Why do you do this for? Meaning these people from Iraq came, and they were kind of not too sure with Abu Hurairah. Like, is he speaking the truth? No, no one else does this. We don't see the great senior uh, sahaba quoting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so freely. Why does Abu Hurairah do this? So Abu Hurairah felt hurt. And he said to them that, listen, hadith of Sahih Bukhari, listen very carefully. He says that I complained to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam due to the weakness of my memory. I complained, the messenger of Allah, I tried to learn. I tried to learn your words, but I find it hard. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in one hadith we find the messenger of Allah brings his shawl forward, places it onto the chest, and he also places the hand onto the chest of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. And he gives a slight push. And then Rasulullah says to Abu Hurairah, Abu Hurairah, from this moment on, you will never ever forget anything that I say to you. He became Abu Hurairah anhu. He has favored the ummah in the field of hadith. So much so we find that the masters of hadith say, from Abu Hurairah, we have been blessed to have 5,374 hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu who sacrificed everything just to be in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in 3 years he achieved that which no other companion achieved in the field of hadith if you have a determination to do something don't look at time don't look at how long it'll take put your head down stay focused allah will allow you to do things in such a short period of time that someone spending 10 years 15 years will not be able to do allah gives barakah if you really have that zeal the way abu hurairah had this zeal Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu says, قال, قيل يا رسول الله, it was asked to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, man abarru, that a person asked, O Messenger of Allah, who should I be good to? قال sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ummak, be good to your mother. قال ثم man, then who? قال ummak, be good to your mother. قال ثم man, then who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قال ummak, be good to your mother. قال ثم man, after the third time, O Messenger of Allah, who should I be good to? Qala sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Abak, be good to your father. So here we find that we should be good to both mother and father. And as is the heading of this chapter, Birrul Ab, that we should not forget our father whilst being good to our mother. Our father also deserves me and you being good to him. Wabi qala amirul mu'mineen. قال حدثنا بشر بن محمد قال اخبرنا عبد الله قال اخبرنا يحيى بن ايوب قال حدثنا ابو زرعه ان ابي هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه اتى رجل النبي الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال the same hadith is narrated again but for the barak of the hadith we will narrate the hadith again but there is a slight difference here ابو هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه says a man came to rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and said ما تأمرني o messenger of allah what do you command me to do what should i do give me a command Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Birra ummak, be good to your mother. Thumma aada faqala, birra ummak. Then the person asked again, what else do you command me to do? Rasulullah said, be good to your mother. Thumma aada faqala, birra ummak. He asked again, O Messenger of Allah, what should I do? Command me something to do. Be good to your mother. Qala aada rabi'a. For the fourth time he asked. In this hadith we find, for the fourth time he asked, faqala birra ummak. The fourth reply was also, be good to your mother. Thereafter, ثُمَّ عَادَ الْخَامِسَ He repeated his question and his want for the fifth time. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِرَّ أَبَاقِ Be good to your father. So we find different narrations. We find different times where Rasulullah said twice, be good to your mother and then your father. Sometimes three times, be good to your mother and then your father. In this hadith we find four <coughs> times over, be good to your mother and then be good to your father. But the general summary of all these hadith is the same, which is obviously naturally when it comes to muhabba, when it comes to love for mercy, we have that natural inclination towards our mother. Because we know that that is that being, that mother of ours, who carried us for approximately nine months. Already that extra affection is there in both ways. The way we feel for our mother, our mother feels the extra love and muhabba. She gives us the extra attention because we are from her, we are a part of her. So here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us that we should be good to our parents, both mother and father. Now there's a very big question, and Imam Bukhari will answer this inshallah through this next hadith. The question is that as we're growing up, and as many of us have gone through different life experiences, 
There have been occasions in our life where we think to ourselves that we want something. We want something good in our lives. And when we go to confront our parents, our father, our mother, we feel as though that um, mom, dad might not understand. Dad might not get it. Mom might not get it. They might not understand. How do I approach it? What do I do? That I want to do something, but mom and dad might not be happy. They will be happy. They're stopping me from something. What's the fine balance between keeping our parents happy and not keeping them happy? Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi teaches us next hadith. Wabi qala haddathana hajjaj, qala haddathana hammad, huwa ibn salama, an Sulayman in taymi, an Sa'id in qaysiyi, an ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma qal, ma min muslim in lahu walidani muslimani, yusbihu ilayhima muhtasiban. That there is a believer, a believer who has both of his parents. He starts his day in such a way that he makes the intention that I will be doing good towards my parents. I want to look after my parents. I have the hope that by being good to my parents, muhtasiban, I will be rewarded. Allah will give me reward upon this. But when he has such an intention, when he has such a motive in his life, illa fataha lahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala babain ya'ni min al-jannah. If you have such an intention that I want to do good to my parents, I want to look after my parents, I want to do good to them. You have such an intention, here Ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open for you two doors. Doors of what? Two normal doors? No, min al-jannah. Two doors of jannah. Wa in kana wahidun fa wahidun. And if from your parents you only have one parent, then for you one door of jannah will be opened for you. Wa in aghdaba ahadahuma lam yarudha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anhu hatta yarudha anhu. If one of your parents is displeased with you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not become pleased with you until your parent becomes pleased with you. Qeel, he was asked, Wa in Even if my parents, they do wrong towards me, even if my parents are asking wrong for me, even if my parents are saying something to me that I feel as though that they're not being just to me, even in that state, قال صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما وإن ظلماه even if they are being unjust to you what does this mean you see a very very important part of our life we have to understand we should not allow emotions to be, uh, to take the better of us we should not allow emotions to control us the deen of Allah subhanahu wa taala it is not based on emotion it's not based on how I feel or you feel Allah subhanahu wa taala has set a standard. And sometimes, and this is upsetting, but it is the reality because of ignorance. Because maybe our parents don't have that association with deen, with sharia. They sometimes want something for us which may not be good for us. Before I came today, someone mentioned to me how their parents are adamant on the fact that it's okay, you don't need to pray salah. You don't need to pray zahr salah, you don't need to pray asr salah. Make sure you go for your interview, make sure you go for something, but missing salah, praying salah, it's not a big fact in your life. Wearing hijab, not wearing hijab, uh, you can, you know, you've got the choice. It's okay. That they make certain decisions for us, which is contrary to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that moment, should I still listen to my parents? At that moment, should I still be okay with what my parents are saying? No. We find in a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا طاعة في المخلوق في معصية الخالق. There is no obedience to the creation of Allah when we are disobeying Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Our priorities are wrong. Our focus should be Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Is my Allah happy with me? If Allah is happy with me, then automatically thereafter others will become happy or not. That does not matter. If Allah has commanded me to do a certain thing, then that is the command of Allah. The whole world can go against me. But I will not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes the closest to us, which is our parents, they may make decisions for us. They may say something which we know is contrary to the way of Allah, contrary to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa At that moment, what do we do? Do we shout back and retaliate? No. With love, with hikmah, with wisdom, with muhabba, we have to stand the ground. We have to be firm on our approach. The mother, father, this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to fulfill this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wanting this from me. Thereafter, I will fulfill what you, you, you are asking for. 
For example, if it's the time for salah, and now mother and father need me and you, but salah time is going, now it's zuhr salah, and they want me to go somewhere, before fulfilling the right of my father and my mother, my Allah comes first. I need to fulfill the command of my Allah, thereafter I can go about fulfilling the commands and the requests of my parent. So that will be depending on the individual. You yourself will know that in our life, there are certain avenues, certain points of our life where we reach, where we want to make a decision. But whilst making that decision, be very careful. When it comes to deciding between what should I do? What do my parents want from me? What do I want from myself? But before we look at this, we should ask ourselves the golden question, which is, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want? And if we are making effort to please Allah, then I swear by Allah, automatically everyone else and everything else will fall in place. There are over what, 6 billion people in the world. And in our lives, in our direct lives and in our direct influence, let's say we have 100, 200 people that we converse with, that we stay with. So if we try to fulfill the rights and try to make all 100 people happy, I'm sorry to say it's quite literally impossible. You can't please everyone. You can't make every friend happy. You can't make every brother and sister happy. You can't make your parents happy all the time. So isn't it better that we focus our attention on making Allah happy? After making Allah happy automatically, everyone else and everything else will fall in place, inshallah. So keep that in mind. However, when we are speaking to our parents, how should we speak? Even though we want to express ourselves, a lesson for me and you, a lesson for everyone. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah mentions, وَبِيقَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُسَدَّدٌ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا إِسْمَاعِيلُ إِبْنَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا زِيَادٌ بِنْ مِخْرَاقٌ قَالَ حَدَّثَنِي تَيْسَلَ بِنْ مَيَّاسِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى قَالَ تَيْسَلَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ says, كُنْتُ مَعَ النَّجْدَانِ I was with a group of Najdan, a tribe that had come to Medina Munawwara, and I was with them. فَأَصَبْتُ ذُنُوبًا لَا أَرَاهَ إِلَّا مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ Whilst I was with this group of people, because friends have an influence on you, because depending on your good company and your bad company, it has an effect in your life. So here Taisara says, I was with these people, and I committed some sins. فَأَصَبْتُ ذُنُوبًا لَا أَرَاهَ إِلَّا مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ I did such sins that I thought to myself, these are major sins. So do you know that peer pressure when your friend says to you, oh, forget salah man, let's go there, let's do this. And then we go with the flow of our friends, or the flow of that group, that we forget Allah because we're in a group, we're in a friend circle. This is what happened to this Taisala. He says that I started to disobey Allah. But such with these people, because they had the company of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they weren't like me and you. When they did wrong and they disobeyed Allah, they didn't feel happy about it. Me and you, we don't even care. Taisara says, as soon as I did these wrong actions, I straight away went to the person who was the greatest of that time. The person who I knew that he is my imam, he is my teacher. He says, فَذَكَرُتُ ذَلِكَ لِبْنِ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُمَا قَالْ I went to Ibn Umar, the son of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, and I said to my teacher, Taisara says, I went to Ibn Umar and I said to him that I was with a group of friends, as is prayer pressure, as is the fact that when you're in a group of friends and they get the better of you and you disobey Allah, I disobeyed Allah ibn Umar. And he started to narrate. So me and you, no one is saying that we need to plasterize and speak of our sins and tell the bad things. But if you're really concerned and you feel as though you've done something wrong, then you will go to your teacher. You will go to your Ustaji. You will explain to your Ustaji, Ustaji, I've done such a such a thing. What's the best way for me to now counter this? I've disobeyed Allah in this way. Is there anything I can do that Allah can be happy with me now? This Taisala did wrong. He stayed with bad people. But he went to Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum and mentioned to him that I've done such a such a sin. Qal, ma hiya? Ibn Umar says, what have you done? So qultu, Taisala says, I said, kada wa kada. I did such a such an act. I did this wrong, that wrong, this wrong, that wrong. قال ليست هذا من الكبائر ليست هذه من الكبائر ابن عمر says they are not from the major sins though they are not from the major sins what you have done is not from the major sins هن تسعون in this hadith we find that ابن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنهما says that the major sins are nine I have mentioned this before that sometimes a different number is mentioned in the different narrations of hadith we find Rasulullah says that amongst the kabair there are three or the greatest of the kabair are three or the kabair are this many number, nine 
Some ulama have made the effort to gather all these kabair. Some have gone to the number of 17. Some have gone all the way to the number of 70. Different masters of hadith and Quran have looked into the Quran and hadith and they have tried to come down with a list that this is kabair. This is amongst the major sins, major sins. You will find the works of many great ulama on this topic. But Ibn Umar says, to this person particularly, there are nine. What are they? Al-ishraku billah. To associate any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa qatlu nasima. To kill an innocent person. Our Islam and my Islam and your Islam teaches us that no one has the right to take the life of an innocent person. This is the ruling of Islam. This is the teaching of Islam. The teaching of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالْفِرَارُ مِنَ الزَّهَفِ When the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, then that person does not run away from the command of Allah. وَقَذْفُ الْمُحْسَنَةِ That he does not accuse an innocent woman. He does not talk ill of an innocent woman. He does not gossip. He does not accuse a woman of doing haram, of her being seen in doing wrong actions. He does not accuse that woman. وَأَكْلُ riba. That amongst the kabair is usury, interest, to eat from interest. May Allah Ta'ala forgive us in so many ways in our time. Many of us are involved in this. We need to make an active effort. We need to speak to our ulama, our mufti. We need to ask the other ways around it. Can I save myself from interest? What can I do to protect myself from this life? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, we find in the Quran and Kareem, He is not happy with those that deal with interest. وَأَكْلُ مَالِ الْيَتِيمِ That person who eats from the wealth of an orphan. Who is an orphan? An orphan Islamically in Sharia is that child, is that boy or girl who has lost his or her father before the age of understanding, before the age of maturity. وَإِلْحَادٌ فِي masjid. وَإِلْحَادٌ فِي masjid. That in the masjid it is a major sin to gossip, to say hearsay, random business. Those things that are not of any benefit. To make up gossip, to speak lies, to speak pathetic conversations in the house of Allah. Dirty topics of conversation in the house of Allah. This is amongst the kabair. To make a mockery of Islam. To make a mockery of the deen of Allah. You see many of us without knowing and with knowing, we make certain comments. We think it's a joke. We make comments about the miswaq. We make comments about the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we were to go into Aqaid and if we were to study this properly, we find the Aimma of Aqaid, of Aqeedah, they say if a person is making a mockery of the deen of Allah, kufrun. He has gone against the command of Allah, he has gone against Islam. This is a kabair, a major sin. And to make your parents cry through disobedience. By disobeying your parents to make them cry, it's also amongst the major sins. And this is in line with our chapter and our uh, subheading right now. قَالَ لِي ابن عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَنْهُمَا Ibn Umar, after mentioning these nine points of major sins, he didn't stop there. You see, when someone really wants goodness for you, and they say good words to you that do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, that's not all. They will always tell you something extra. When a person tells you something extra, my respected teacher whilst mentioning this hadith mentions to us, that our teachers in Darul Loom and in our Madaris, our Hibs teacher, in reality, if I'm being honest with you, for example, using Ustaji Mufti Sab as an example, those of you that have been blessed to become Hafiz on the Mufti Sab, that's it, job done. Hafiz Zain, finish. Finish, job done. Thereafter, Mufti Sahib has been making that continuous effort for you to now understand the book of Allah, for you to understand what Allah is saying now. He is teaching you the translation of the glorious Quran. That's extra. That's more than what was required from him. When you became Hafiz on that day, your parents were happy with Ustadji. That Ustadji, Mufti Sahib, has made an effort on my child. Everything else is a bonus now. Ibn Umar, after mentioning these nine points to give him satisfaction, you have not done a major sin. Finished. But he continues to speak to Qaysala and Qaysala and says to Qaysala, Atafraku min al nar wa tuhibbu an tadkhul al jannah? Do you wish to stay far from Jahannam and do you want to go towards Jannah? Do you want to enter Jannah? Kultu e wallahi. Yes, definitely. Obviously, I want to enter Jannah. Qaysala says this. Qala ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Ahayyun walidak. Is your, are your parents alive? Are your parents alive? Qultu indi ummi. Taisala says, yes, my mother is alive. I have my mother. 
قال ابن عمر says فوالله لو ألنت لها الكلام if you are soft in your speech towards her if you are soft the way you speak to your mother towards your mother with softness with sweetness وَأَتْعَمْتَهَا الطَّعَامِ and you feed your mother you look after her when she has now reached an age where she is weak now she looked after you when you were the child now the tables have turned she is becoming weaker now when she used to prepare your food and after school you're coming back and she didn't expect anything from you now it's time that you focus on your washing now it's time you focus on cleaning up after eating now it's time that you make an active effort to help around the house if you do so لَتَدْخُلَنَّ الْجَنَّةِ you will enter, لَتَدْخُلَنَّ you will definitely enter Jannah مَا اجْتَنَبْتَ الْكَبَائِرِ as long as you continue to stay away from the major sins and the disobediences of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we were to go into major and minor sins that is a great topic in itself and there are different, different the ulama have mentioned different um, sayings regarding what is major, what is minor. But one b- saying and one opinion which I really love for myself, and I think we should all try to make this the saying in our life is that every sin, small or big, is a major sin. It, why? Because it's not just a sin. That word sin that we say, oh, it's a guna. Oh, guna kar liya, usme kya hai? Oh, I've just sinned. What's there? I just disobeyed Allah. Oh, it's a minor sin. Minor. If it's a minor sin, minor. Major sin, oh, tawbah kar lunga. I'll just do tawbah. Nee. That's not how it works. Don't call it sin. Because we don't feel the guilt of that disobedience. Change the word sin to equal disobedience of Allah. Now say, I have disobeyed Allah. Oh, I disobeyed Allah. This is a major disobedience of Allah. This is still, though we want to call it minor, it's still the disobedience of Allah. I have made my Allah unhappy. Hazrat Ashraf Ali Tanwi rahimahullah ta'ala very beautifully gives an analogy. That if you have scorpions, big scorpions and small scorpions, or big snakes and small snakes, both are poisonous. Will you only save yourself from the big snakes and the big scorpions? Or will you also be very, very careful regarding the small scorpions and the small poisonous snakes? They're all the same. So why do we differentiate? That differentiation only came just so that we can understand between what is going to be the recompense of this guna. Because of these, is there going to be qiyas? Is there going to be qisas? Is there going to be hudud? Is there going to be ta'zir? Is there going to be punishment? Are we going to be reprimanded for this guna or not? This is why we have this division. But for myself, I should feel as though every disobedience of Allah is the disobedience of Allah. I don't want to disobey Allah. Anything small or big I do, quickly, quickly, we should turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Imam, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, the next hadith says, وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا بُو نُعِينَ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا سُفْيَانَ عَنْ حِشَامِ بِنْ عُرْوَى عَنْ أَبِيهِ وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ قَالَ لَا تَمْتَنِعْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَحَبَّاهُ Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala mentions from his teachers until he comes to Urwa rahimahullah ta'ala who was blessed to be in the company of Aisha radiyallahu anha, our mother. Aisha radiyallahu anha. He mentions regarding the verses of the glorious Quran of Surah Israel, verse number 24, where Allah says, وَخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرحمة. That spread over them humbly the wings of your tenderness, the wings of your mercy. That in front of your parents, have this approach of mercy. That humble yourself in front of them. That lower yourself. No matter how big you will become, no matter how much of an alim, a hafiz you may be, no matter how successful you will be in life, always remember, they are still your parents. They are still Abba. They are still Ammi. They are still your parents. They still see you in the same light that they saw you 20 years ago, 16 years ago, 40 years ago. If you today are 26, 27, in front of your mother and your father, you are still that one, two-year-old child that they used to remember and they used to see. They still see you in the same way. My respected teacher once mentioned, if someone has some flesh t- taken from his thigh, if I was to cut a piece of the thigh off and I was to separate some of the meat, I want to ask you, what feels the pain? Does the thigh feel the pain or does that separated piece of flesh feel the pain? Who feels the pain? The thigh or the separated flesh? Who feels the pain? The thigh. You've cut it from the thigh. We are from our parents. We are from them. They feel that pain more than that flesh feels that pain. 
So we need to consider these points. We need to consider these points. So here Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala mentions to me and you and reminds me and you that we need to be very, very attentive towards our parents. The next hadith is a very famous hadith and this hadith is regarding Ibn Umar and when he saw someone doing the tawaf of the house of Allah. When this person was going around the house of Allah, the Kaaba, but he was doing something very different. What does Imam Bukhari say to me and you? وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا آدَمْ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا شُعْبَ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا سَعِيدٌ بِنَا بِي بُرْدَ قَالَ سَمِعْتُ أَبِي يُحَدِّثُ أَنَّهُ شَهِدَ إِبْنُ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَنْهُمَا رَجُلًا يَمَانِيًّا يَتُوفُ بِالْبَيْتِ Ibn Umar رضي الله تعالى عنهما he saw a Yemeni man a man who had come from Yemen, he was circulating the house of Allah, the Kaaba. However, Hamala ummahu wara zahri. He wasn't just circulating the house of Allah by himself. On his back, he had his mother. Who did he have? His mother on his back. And while circulating the house of Allah, Ibn Umar says that this person, Yaqul, he said, Inni laha ba'iruha al-mudhallal in, in uzirat rikabuha lam uz'ar. Uh, he started to recite some poetry that indeed I, I am a lonely, I am a lowly beast. I am a lowly mount for my mother. In Uzi'irat Rikabuha, if she was to have a camel and that camel would become tired of carrying her, I, Lam Uzar, I will never become tired of carrying my mother. So proudly he started to speak regarding this. And he is circulating the house of Allah. ثُمَّ قَالْ يَبْنَ عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُمَا He comes to Ibn Umar and says, Ibn Umar, أَتَرَانِي جَزَيْتُهَا Do you think that I have now recompensed all of the efforts of my mother? Have I repaid her? For every goodness, for every blessing, for everything she did for me, have I repaid her now? That I am such a son, such a humble, such an honored son, that I am carrying my mother around the house of Allah. What more can a mother ask from a son? Have I done enough? Qala ibn Umar, La, la, wa la bi zafratin wahida. You have not been able to do nothing, not even one ounce of the blessing of your mother. You have not been able to fulfill that by doing this action also. Nothing. Regarding this same hadith, we find ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah says in a narration regarding this, that that first screech of pain that your mother felt when you were coming on the face of this earth, when you were coming to this world, that first ounce of pain and that first ah, that pain that she felt and that first sound of pain that she made. You can do the tawaf of the house of Allah, but you cannot even recompense that first sound of pain that your mother made. This is what a mother has done for me and you. Every mother. And mothers being mothers, they have different ways of expressing their love. Some mothers might be strict in their approach. Some mothers might be soft in their approach. But they are still your mother. Appreciate that mother. That mother wants goodness for you. She sees you as your, chi- as your child. Yes, sometimes, sometimes it is the case. I am not going to completely dismiss the fact that sometimes they can be really harsh. Daughters, I know, sisters, they curry about how the mother is very harsh upon her, very strict on her. But you don't know what your mother knows. That mother being strict on you knows that 20 years later, 25 years later, you will be leaving your mother. You will now need to leave, uh, live your life in someone else's household. That mother's strictness is not strictness. It is her extreme mercy and her love. Because she is preparing you for a life that you will no longer have your mother. She is preparing you with that strictness, with that hidden love. That my daughter needs to learn. My daughter needs to know. What it, need, what it means to be a mother, what mother, what it means to be a daughter. That's why there's that extra strength and that extra harshness at times. It's only through mercy, only through love. Now Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, after mentioning the mother, he wants to give an example of a relationship between a, between a child, between a son and the mother. I pray to Allah, those of you that have your mothers, that Allah can allow you to have such a relationship. Imam Bukhari mentions. This hadith is repeated twice. I will explain it now. And when it comes again, I will read it, inshallah. وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ عَبْنِ صَالِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنِ اللَّيْثٌ قَالَ حَدَّثَنِي خَالِدٌ بِنْ يَزِيدٌ أَنْ سَعِيدٍ بِنْ أَبِي هِلَالٌ أَنْ أَبِي حَازِمٌ أَنْ أَبِي مُرَّةٌ مَوْلَ أَقِيلٌ أَنَّ أَبَا هُرَيْرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُ كَانَ يَسْتَخْلِفُهُ مَرْوَانٌ مَرْوَانٌ إِبْنِ حَكَمٌ who became 
the governor and the leader in Medina Munawwara, whenever he used to leave from Medina Munawwara, he would uh, fix Hazrat Abu Hurairah to be the ambassador and to be the governor to take a lead and charge of Medina Munawwara. And وكان يكون بذي الحليفة أبو هريرة used to live in ذو الحليفة ذو الحليفة is that point is the ميقات of مدينة منورة from where you will enter into the state of إحرام from مدينة منورة towards مكة مكرمة this is ذو الحليفة حليفة أبو هريرة used to live there فكانت أمه في بيت وهو في آخر his mother used to live in a separate house and he used to live in a separate house also his mother because the hadith of his mother is coming up. But just to make you understand and appreciate his mother, I will tell you this hadith now, and when the actual hadith comes up, inshallah, maybe possibly next month, or maybe in April, inshallah, Rahman, how his mother accepted Islam. Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, coming in Aladhu al-Mufrad, inshallah. I pray we both see the day, and we are both there to witness this hadith. Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala comes, Ya Rasulullah, ud'u Make dua for my mother. She's not a Muslim. Make dua for my mother. Make dua for her. That pain that I want my mother to accept Islam. I have found the beauty of Islam very late. Only three years remain before Rasulullah will return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will not be on the face of this earth anymore. Rasulullah makes dua. Oh Allah, make Abu Huraira and his mother beloved to you. Make them beloved to you. In the narration we find Abu Huraira, as soon as Rasulullah said this, Abu Huraira ran towards his house. He ran towards his house. That's for the sound effects. He ran towards his house. He runs towards his home. As soon as he enters, he finds that his mother has just returned from Ghusl. She has just bathed herself and she has now dressed and she has returned from bathing herself. And she says to her son, before he says anything, Ya Aba Huraira, Ya Ibna, Aslam tu, I have accepted Islam. I have accepted Islam. The narrators of this hadith, Hafiz ibn Hajr al-Asqalani makes an amazing point. He says that why did Abu Huraira run for? When Rasulullah, when he asked Rasulullah, oh Rasulullah, make dua for my mother, he should be standing there waiting for Rasulullah to finish the dua. As soon as Rasulullah looked up and said, Oh Allah, make Abu Huraira and his mother beloved to you. Why did Abu Huraira quickly go away from the um, uh, company of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Hafiz ibn Hajr al-Asqalani beautifully replies saying, Abu Huraira wanted to know, will I reach my home first or will the dua of Rasulullah reach my home first? And as soon as he went to his house, he finds before he could say anything, before he could examine the situation of his mother, is she becoming soft towards Islam? Before he says anything, she says, Ya Abu Huraira, Aslamtu, I have accepted Islam. And this Abu Huraira and his mother, what was their relationship? She used to live in one house, he used to live in another. Qala fa'idha arada yahruja waqafa ala babiha faqal. Whenever Abu Huraira would make the intention to, live, to leave Dhul Halifa, to go towards Medina Munawwara, to go wherever for any business, he would go to the door of his mother, to the house of his mother and say, Assalamu alayki ya ummata. May the peace of Allah be upon you, Ya Ummata, O oh my beloved mother, Ummata, my beloved mother. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and may the mercy of Allah and the blessings of Allah be upon you. This is the son saying this to his mother. Listen to the reply of his mother. Fatakul, she used to say, Wa alayka ya bunayya, and may the peace of Allah be upon you, O oh my beloved son. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and the mercy of Allah and the blessings of Allah. Fayakul, he wouldn't stop there. Before leaving for his business, before leaving his home, he would say to his mother again, Rahimakillahu kama rabbaytini saghira. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you, my mother, the way you nurtured me and raised me whilst I was young. Fatakul. That's the dua he used to give his mother. And she used to say, Rahimakallahu kama bararatani kabira. And may Allah have mercy upon you, my son, Abu Huraira, the way you have cared for me in my old age. The way you have cared for me when I am old, when I am feeble, you have cared for me. Thumma idha arada, he would leave and ayyadukhula sana'a mithla. Whenever he would return back, 
from his business, whenever he would return back to his home, before going to his house, he would go to his mother and repeat the exact same thing. And this hadith has been mentioned by this chain of narration. Imam Bukhari, after the next hadith, one more hadith later, he mentions the same hadith, but with a different narration. And the masters of hadith explain, if there is the same scenario, same situation, and it's got a different narration, and there is a slight difference, one reason is, is because it happened more than once. So we'll find that the same thing happened at a different place with Abu Huraira again. But before that hadith, the second to last hadith for today is وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا أَبُوْ نُعِيمُ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا سُفْيَانُ أَنْ عَطَى إِبْنِ السَّائِبُ أَنْ أَبِيهِ أَنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بِنْ عَمْرٍ رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال جاء رجل إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم A man came to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم يبايعه على الهجرة He wanted to pledge his allegiance to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم for the hijra that he will migrate from Mecca مكرمة to Medina منور with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم He wants to migrate with Rasulullah and remember Rasulullah he started to give open permission that those that are being persecuted in Mecca you are allowed to leave Rasulullah did not leave with the rest of the companions he lived, uh, le- uh, left later with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an وَتَرَكَ أَبَوَيْهِ يَبْكِيَانَ with this man that came to pledge his allegiance that I want to go to Medina Munawwara he has come in such a state he has left his parents displeased and crying they are crying that our son is leaving Mecca Mukarrama. He's going to Medina Murrah. They're upset. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَقَالْ إِرْجِعْ إِلَيْهِمَا Return back to your parents. Go back to them now. Before you can pledge your allegiance to go to Medina Munawwara with me, go back to your parents. وَأَضْحِكْهُمَا كَمَا أَبْكَيْتَهُمَا Go make them smile and laugh the way you left them crying. Go back and make them smile and laugh. Hazrat Ashraf Ali Tanwi rahimahullahu ta'ala in his Adab al-Mu'ashara, a very simple, very beautiful book. In there, he makes a point that I think is worth for everyone to know today. He says, under the chapter, a chapter of the Adab, the etiquettes of your teacher, your spiritual teacher, he mentions today how unfortunate. We have turned the tables. We have given preference to Sheikh. We have given preference to Asatis, our teachers. And then we have left our parents right at the bottom. The reality should have been that our parents come first, then our teachers, then our sheikh. Explaining that our parents have a great right upon us. Before the teacher, before the uh, mentor, our parents have this right. We should learn, Rasulullah wasallam. do you want to know regarding someone who sacrificed seeing Rasulullah wasallam? Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani says that to be named as a sahabi, a companion, Someone who was blessed to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu You only need a moment. You only need a moment that you are in the state of Islam. You will remain in the state of Islam. You will die on Islam. But you have been blessed to see and be in the company of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To the extent, if you are blind, but you are in a state where Rasulullah has seen you. You have accepted Islam. You are in the state of Islam. You leave the face of this earth with Islam. You are also a Sahabi. Radiyallahu anhum ajma'een with whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them Jannah. Allah has given them the glad tidings. Allah is happy with the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa A man sacrificed this. For who? He wrote a letter to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Always Qarni, rahimahullahu ta'ala, who amongst the masters of spirituality say that he is the Sayyidul, uh, the Sayyidul Tabi'een. That he is the greatest of all the Tabi'een. Always Qarni. Why? Because he writes to Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, I want to come and see you. From Qarn. I want to come and see you. I want to spend time in your company. But I have an ill, old mother. Because I am attending to her, I can't come and see you. I can't spend time with you. I can't be a sahabi. I can't be a companion. What do I do? Shall I leave my mother and come to your messenger of Allah? Rasulullah, through his scribes, he replies back saying, No, for you is your mother. And in this hadith, though the hadith can be questioned, but it's worthy and not- notable to mention, Rasulullah speaks to Umar and Ali. Oh, Umar, or oh, Ali, it's always Karni will come at a time. He will come one year. And he speaks specifically to Umar and Ali. He will come a year of Hajj. He will come. But he will come after I have left the face of this earth. When he comes, O oh, Umar, O oh, Ali, who, who is Umar? The Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ali, the Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amongst the four Khulafai Rashidin. In the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala amongst the foremost elite. And Rasulullah says to Umar and Ali, 
when obeys qarni comes then it is incumbent upon you incumbent upon you that you ask this obeys qarni for dua because Allah accepts his dua this is that obeys qarni he sacrificed companionship of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to serve his mother and this was rasulullah he didn't ask for his rights he looked at the rights of others he understood the situation he understood me and you we jump we make decisions without understanding my rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam understood he inspected the situation the scene and then he gave his judgment so here we find that we should please our parents allah give me and you all the tawfiq the final hadith for today inshallah وبي قال حدثنا عبد الرحمن بن شيبه قال حدثنا أخ... قال اخبر اخبرني ابن ابي الفديك قال حدثني موسى نبي حازم ان ابا مره مولى ام مولى ام حانم بنت ابي طالب هو از ام حاني ام حاني از ذا دوتر اوف ابو طالب ذا سيستر اوف علي رضي الله تعالى عنه عن ذا كوزن سيستر اوف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اخبره انه ركب مع ابي هريره ها فريد سليف Abu Murrah says that أنه ركب مع أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه إلى أرضه بالعقيق I was with Abu Hurair رضي الله تعالى عنه I mounted with Abu Hurair to a place in Aqiq Abu Hurair was residing in this place of Aqiq فإذا دخل أرضه When he entered the area of Aqiq which is on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara صاح بأعلى بأعلى صوته With a raised voice This Abu Hurair says Again, عليك السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته يا أمته. May the peace of Allah, may the mercy of Allah, may the blessings of Allah be upon you, my mother, O oh, my beloved mother. <coughs> Abu Hurairah says this in a loud voice. تقول when his mother hears this, she says, وعليك السلام ورحمة الله وعليك السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. May the peace of Allah, may the mercy of Allah be upon you too, my son. Yaqul Abu Hurairah, the way he said before in the second to last hadith, Abu Hurairah says again, this time a different person is witnessing the way Abu Hurairah is with his mother. It wasn't for show. It wasn't the way me and you, we pretend to show in front of people our beautiful character. And as soon as no one's there or someone else is there, we change. Abu Hurairah was true to his mother. He says, رَحِمَكِ اللَّهُ كَمَا رَبَّيْتِنِي صَغِيرًا May Allah have mercy upon you, my mother. The way you looked after me and nurtured me whilst I was young. فَتَقُولْ يَا بُنَيَّا She says, O my beloved son, وَأَنْتَ فَجَزَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا وَرَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْكَ كَمَا بَرَرْتَنِي كَبِيرًا O my beloved son, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the best of rewards. Indeed, may Allah be pleased with you because of the way you are looking after me and the way you are with me at this old age of mine. So Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala anhu was this for his mother. It is upsetting that in our time and in this time of life, we are so busy with everything in life that we forget these important people in our life. When friends come into our lives, when different people come into our lives, We forget the people that actually care for us. And if I'm being very honest and blunt with you, do you know friends? Friends that we consider that today in school or today at work or those friends that I've had for the last few years, we believe they'll be there for us all the way. I'm sorry, the bitter truth of life is friends come and go. Friends will come and go. It might come to a point that you upset your friend or he or she upsets you and that's it, finished. Friendship dies on that. Or you're not the same anymore. Friendship just fades away. Or when you move from college to work or from uni or different groups of people you meet, you lose your old associates. It happens. But your parents, your family, that person that you have made your wife or that man that you have made your husband becomes your everything. They're the real people in your life. But how upsetting is it that we have given preference to what? The night out with the lads. the chills and the every evening or the every second evening every other time it's all about the lads holiday time comes you're away from them school friends but we can't live away from them we still want to chill with them we still want to spend time with them and we forget that the real people in our lives are those sitting at home those that are making dua day in day out for us that when we are out chilling till 12 o'clock 1 o'clock 2 o'clock at night when we think no one in the world cares for us they are those people that are caring for us sitting at home and we forget this and that's a reality check for everyone sitting here for me for us all wallahi lazim 
I asked myself so many times that if I could go back in time, when, before I started Darulun, before I left Oldham to go to Leicester and study in Leicester for three years, that if only I spent them moments in my weekend properly, that if I actually spend time with my family and more so my mother, that today I don't have that mother to spend time with. When I'm home now, I'm home. I've got all the time in the world to spend time at home. But I don't have that one person that I should have spent time with them. And it's true. You only realize something when it's not there for you anymore. When you lose something or when it's not there for you, that's when you realize its value. So my humble appeal to everyone is, learn, learn to look after your parents. Learn to look after those people that really mean a lot to you. And when there is a question regarding the command of Allah and fulfilling the rights of those around us and those wishes and those requests of people, of parents, of those close to us, then we should give preference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we should also keep in mind that there is a way to say things. There is hikmah, there is wisdom, there is a way of speaking to our parents, to speak to our seniors, to make them understand also. I pray that there are many people that ask for dua, that are going through a hard time at home, at work. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes everything easy for them. I want to finish with an incident just to remind you the barakah of this book of hadith. I mentioned this Friday in our class of Riyadh al-Salihin and I want to mention it to you on Mufti Sab right now. I have a dear friend. He joined us three years ago when we started al al Mufrid in my house. Three years ago. He joined us from the initial days. We're talking in 2014 when this work of al al Mufrid was introduced in my living room. And he's amongst those four or five first ever students that we used to gather and we used to discuss this work, Mufti Sab. When these first few ahadiths came up about father, about mother, and how we should be good to them, even though they may have wronged us, I have a friend and a student who joined us from there. In seven years, how many years? Seven years, he did not speak to his father. This is three years ago. Seven years, his father does not live with them anymore. He has moved uh, to the extent he doesn't live in the country anymore. He moved. Seven years, he has not spoken to his father. Because of whatever rift they had at home, he hasn't spoken to his father. Through the barakah of hadith, through the barakah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa words, after them seven years, he found it in himself to contact his father. And he asked for forgiveness. Though when his father left, there were so many problems at home, he asked his father for forgiveness. That dad, father, Abbaji, forgive me. And he mended his ways in them three years. Since then, he started to mend his way with his father. His father would visit from abroad. He would come, stay for a few months, stay for a few weeks, go back. And there was a relationship that forgiveness was there. Forgive and forget happened through the barakah of hadith. And that son who was not on deen them three years ago, we're talking in 2014, through attending such durus of hadith, through connecting himself to works of jama'ah and those works that make you realize and make you make them changes, this brother became more intact with deen. He found deen. He found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just recently, in November, his father passed away abroad. His father passed away abroad, not here. In three years, such is the effect of the barakah of hadith. His father has passed away abroad. He has altogether three or four brothers. From them three or four brothers, he made a point to book an emergency ticket. Emergency ticket to go to Bangladesh. On that day that his father has passed away, it's within the next 24 hours, his father will have to be buried. He, from all of his siblings, they all live here. He made a point that I will make an emergency ticket to go to Bangladesh. He booked an emergency ticket that evening. His father passed away. News came at 9 o'clock in the morning. At 6 o'clock, he's at Manchester airport. He's off to Bangladesh. Everything, Dufan Kafan was ready, prepared. His father was uh, bathed, bathed and everything was ready for him to be buried now. Guess who leads the janaza? That son who did not speak to his father for seven years, three years later, that very son leads the janaza of his father. And he leaves the earth with, his, with him leading the janaza of his father. This is what hadith can do. This is what realization can make and the differences it can make in our life. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from everyone. Jazakallah khair. It's amazing to see you all. I pray Allah gathers us again inshallah next month. Allah ta'ala accept. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi will inshallah speak to us a bit more about parents inshallah next month. Jazakallah khairan. Ahsan jazah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al